Thank you, Annette. That was beautiful. That was The Swallows, written by Connor Chi. And welcome. Hello. This is the virtual Sunday service of the Humboldt Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which we like to call Huff. My name is Scarlett Tripsmith, and I will be your technical liaison for today. If this is your first time joining us, we are so happy that you found us, and please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat to everyone. We welcome you warmly. We welcome you, and we know that you come from different places, different religions, different beliefs, different backgrounds, but we hope that you can find comfort and connection here today. As you can see, you are muted. However, later in the service, we will be breaking out into some soul-searching breakout rooms back at the end of the service during our virtual coffee hour. So please stick around afterwards for our virtual coffee hour. And if you feel so comfortable, please keep your cameras turned on. We love seeing all of your beautiful faces and it's our way of engaging during this time when we cannot safely meet together. But these online services are our way of connecting and continuing to keep the mission of our congregation alive. Today, we have Stephen Satong taking our joys, sorrows, and celebrations. So please, if you feel called, go to the chat, look up Stephen Satong, and send them directly there. We're so glad you're here, joining us and engaging with the work through embracing diversity and empowering those connections. Because of this, we acknowledge and honor that the land that which we live on is the traditional home of the We Are people. And we are committed to fighting for the worth and dignity of every person in our community and out. We want to remind ourselves to put our words and our principles into action for the justice of the common good. So good morning. Let's wake up. Let's wake up from the morning exhaustion of Sunday. Let's wake up from waiting for a last few more minutes in bed. Let's wake up to the world that we live in, to its beauty and wonder and to its tragedy and pain. In the words of our friends and colleagues involved in Black Lives Matter, we must stay woke for every day for racial justice in our country. Let us wake up, let us stay awake, let us stay woke. Together we pledge action to transcend barriers, be they racial, political, economic, social, or religious. We pledge to make our tomorrows become our todays. We welcome you and thank you for sharing your presence with us today. And now it is time and it is the place. Let us worship together. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joanne Huffman and Stephen Satong for our chalice lighting and aspiration. To bring us into sacred space, we'll ring the bell. You who feel your heart is breaking, come in. You who are confused and wondering, come in. You who are angry and pain or not wanting to be here, come in. You who are hopeful and energized, come in. Come into this community of your heart where you have been held in love and in comfort where you have shared your joy and your spirit, where you have asked questions because you felt they needed asking, where you have found friendship and companions, where you have sometimes not agreed, sometimes not felt comforted, sometimes not felt heard. Bring your broken heart and your grief, share them. Bring your confusion and your questions, share them. Bring your anger and your pain, share them. Bring your hope and your energy, share them. For here in this place, we can be together. We can gather in all the conflicting emotions tumbling around in our heads and our hearts. We bring them together here and lay them on the altar of community. For community means that fragile, not perfect human beings can come together in the name of peace and seek to find peace again. Peace, hope, healing, 
May it be so. Please join me now in the re recitation of our aspiration. May love be the spirit of this fellowship. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. Thank you so much. And here is a little brief announcement for us all uh, for a reminder to save the date, February 21st. After the service, we'll be having a congregational discussion about the possibility of the fellowship committing to pay an annual voluntary honor tax to the Wiat people on whose ancestral lands that which the fellowship is located. So please put it in your calendars, your date book, write it down on a random piece of paper that you will hopefully look at later and uh, join us in this congregational discussion. We really wanna hear what you have to say. So thank you so much. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Sandy Lynn for our story of all ages, the fire race. Today I'm reading the fire race. Let's see if you can see that better if I do that. Maybe. The fire race, a Karuk coyote tale. Retold by Jonathan London, illustrated by Sylvia Long. Fire race. Long ago, the animal people had no fire. Day and night, they huddled in their houses in the dark and ate their food uncooked. In the winter, they were so cold, icicles hung from their fur. Oh, they were miserable. Then one day, wise old coyote gathered everybody together. We have heard about fire, he said, but the only fire is far up river at the world's end. It's guarded by the Yellow Jacket sisters high atop a snowy mountain. They are wicked and will not share it. But listen, if we all cooperate and work together, we can steal the fire. There was much fearful murmuring about the Yellow Jacket sisters, but all grew quiet as Coyote told them his plan. Then he went on his way. Grandfather Coyote slowly trudged up the mountain at the world's end. When at last he came to the Yellow Jacket's house, smoke was rising from the smoke hole. It's way up here on the picture. <laughs> Coyote looked inside. The three old sisters were sitting around the fire. Coyote said, as friendly as can be, if you let me in, I'll make you all look pretty. Suspicious, the three sisters put up their heads, put their heads close together and buzzed. Come in, they said, but no tricks. Old man Coyote sat down and took a chunk of oak bark between his toes and held it in the fire. When it had burned to a blackened coal, he marked their yellow faces and bodies with black stripes to make them pretty. Now, said Coyote, if you close your eyes, I will make you even prettier. Here was Coyote's chance. While the Yellow Jacket's eyes were closed, he took the charred oak in his teeth and silent as the moon in the sky he crept outside then he raced down the mountain like the wind when the yellow jacket sisters found out what coyote had that coyote had tricked them they were screaming mad they too flew like the wind and it wasn't long until they caught up to coyote 
They were almost on him when Coyote tripped, rolled downhill like a snowball, and landed smack at Eagle's feet. Snatching the glowing coal in his talons, Eagle spread his wings and took to the sky. Eagle was swift, but the yellow jacket soon caught up with him. Suddenly, Eagle dropped the coal. Below, Mountain Lion caught it in his great teeth and bounded off through the snow. Still furious, yellow jackets followed. Just as they were about to sting Mountain Lion, Fox snatched the fiery coal and bounced in among the tall cedar and pine. Fox ran and ran until she was so tired she couldn't take another step. She huffed and puffed. Her breath made clouds and the yellow jackets were right behind her. Just in time, Bear took the fire and lunged away through some brambles. Bear too was quick, Yet the yellow jackets were right on top of her. Even Bear could not fight them off, and she finally tumbled in exhaustion. As Bear fell, Measuring Worm, the long one, took the fire. The long one stretched way out over three ridges. Yet the yellow jackets were there, waiting and ready to strike. Somehow, right under the yellow jacket's eyes, Turtle sneaked in, grabbed the fire, and scrambled off. But of course, Turtle was slow, and one of the yellow jacket sisters stung him in his tail. A key, a key, a key! Turtle pulled in his head and legs and flip flopped down the hill. Falump, falump, falump. The yellow jackets were swarming all over Turtle when Frog leaped out of the river and swallowed the fire. Gulp. Then Frog hopped back onto the river, into the river, plop, and sat on the bottom. The yellow jackets, but were uh, sorry. <laughs> yellow jackets stormed the river, circling once, circling twice. Circling three times, buzzing the surface. They waited, and they waited, and they waited. But Frog held the fire and his breath. Finally, the Yellow Jackets gave up and flew back home. As soon as the Yellow Jacket sisters were gone, Frog burst out of the water and spat the hot coal into the roots of a willow growing along the river. The tree swallowed the fire, and the animal people didn't know what to do. And once again, Coyote came along, and the animal people said, Grandfather, you must show us how to get the fire from the willow. So Old Man Coyote, who is very wise and knows these things, said, Ha! Huh. And he showed them how to rub two willow sticks together over dry moss to make fire. From that time on, the people have known how to coax fire from the wood in order to keep warm and to cook their food. And at night, in the seasons of cold, they have sat in a circle around their fires and listened as the elders told them the old stories. And so it is, even to this day. Kapu'ana Kanakana. <laughs> it's our custom to share our joys and sorrows with each other and to drop a stone for them. Our first one is from Sue Lee Mossman, who says, Happy birthdays coming up to Archie Mossman. Steve Satong, Joanne Huffman, and Stacia Allen.
from Debbie and Greg. Thanks to everyone for your good thoughts and support. And from the other Debbie, last week, uh, Debbie's nine-year-old nephew was exposed to COVID and but thankfully came up negative. From Colleen Broderick, thanks to all who got vac, well, for all of us who got vaccinated this week. Allison O'Dowd says, excited to share that my parents were recently vaccinated. And from Scarlett, uh, stage lights went out for my dear friend, Jay Chimo who was an amazing theatrical genius his whole life. His wit and wild ways will be missed. A stone of celebration for me for a story that I've only been trying to get published for 12 years now that has finally gotten published. And one last stone for all those joys and sorrows unsaid but held in our hearts. Let us have a moment of silence. Please join us in this hymn as you're able. The words will be at the bottom of the page and hopefully we can make a joyful noise.
This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing John Burens, who has been president of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations and is now currently the president of the Unitarian Universalist History and Heritage Society. He's coming to us by Skype from San Francisco, and he's written Conflagration, how the transcendentalists sparked the American struggle for racial, gender, and social justice, which will be the subject of his sermon today. All of you will be able to find the reference in the various things that are mailed out to you for this, and I encourage you to read it. Now, without anything, any further ado, John? Thank you, Joanne. It's a privilege to be with this fellowship this morning and to hear you share your joys and sorrows with one another. It's no secret that all of us have been pained in recent years at a clear resurgence of racism and violence in our country. And I want to point out that we are now experiencing something relatively rare. The phenomenon of white American leadership actually listening to and becoming active allies to black, indigenous, and other peoples of color. I think of President Biden's first executive order, rescinding the permits for the Dakota Access Pipeline at the request of the Lakota peoples of Great Plains, and then nominating as the new Secretary of the Interior, a Native American woman, Congresswoman Deb Holland of New Mexico. Of course, we also witnessed on the 6th of January, the outgoing president encouraging white supremacists to storm the very citadel of democracy, the US Capitol, some of them literally hoping to bring about a second civil war, reminding me how my book is about how it was white supremacists in South Carolina who did exactly that in April of 1861, rejecting the election victory of Abraham Lincoln and then firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Out here in California, you know, although Lincoln carried the state just barely, winning its four electoral votes by with 32%, uh, a margin over the Democratic nominee Stephen Douglas of only 734 ballots. He did it with the organizational and rhetorical help of the remarkable Unitarian minister, Thomas Starr King, newly arrived in San Francisco. And of course, the fact that the opposition to Lincoln was divided three ways. Most Californians, were anything but anti-slavery. Why, in September of 1859, David Terry, who had been the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, actually challenged US Senator David Broderick, a member of his own party, to a duel for not being pro-slavery enough, and then shot and killed him. It was just months later that in your neighborhood in Humboldt Colbert County, in February of 1860, white settlers without any provocation attacked the encampment of white people on Tulawa, called by the settlers Indian Island. They did so at a time when most of the adult men were away, gathering supplies for the Wyatt's annual world renewal ceremony. And so most of those who were massacred were women, children, and elders, 
perhaps as many as 250 of them. But this was simply the largest of several coordinated attacks on the peaceful wilds. In three other instances, perhaps another 100 or more native people were killed. The island encampment was torched in a conflagration. And yet a few women escaped in order to bear witness to the atrocity, which shocked many people. But in nearby Arcata, then called Uniontown, no one more so than a young writer named Bret Hart. At the age of 23, he had been left in charge of the local newspaper because his boss was away in Sacramento. He not only reported the massacre in some detail, but he also editorialized strongly against it, saying a more shocking and revolting spectacle was never exhibited to the eyes of a Christian and civilized people. Old women wrinkled and decrepit lay weltering in blood their brains dashed out and dabbled with their long gray hair, infants scarce a span long, with their faces cloven with hatchets and their bodies ghastly with wounds. He wasn't alone in refusing to be a silent bystander. Blessedly, there were some local citizens who wrote to the San Francisco newspapers also condemning the massacres. Yet within weeks, after multiple threats on his life, Hart had to flee and come to the Bay Area himself, where his widowed mother had married the man who had just been elected the mayor of Oakland. Here he found work with a San Francisco newspaper and then came to the attention of 35-year-old Thomas Starr King, who had arrived from the East just that April. Both of them became part of a circle of pro-union activists hosted by Jesse Benton Fremont, the daughter of a Missouri senator who had opposed the expansion of slavery, and of Colonel John C. Fremont, the explorer politician who preceded Lincoln by running for president on that platform in 1856. They gathered at Black Rock, the Fremont home overlooking Alcatraz on a height above Fort Mason. The Fremonts actually took a pew in Star King's church in Young Bret Hart also joined. In fact, he married the alto soloist in the church choir. Star King often ended his anti-slavery and pro-union speeches with poems written by Bret Hart. Together with others, they succeeded in keeping California in the union. But Thomas Star King also did four other remarkable things. During that terrible war, he raised more money than anyone else in the country for a Unitarian-led predecessor to the Red Cross called the U.S. Sanitary Commission, itself the largest humanitarian organization to that point in American history. Second, Star King became what one African-American historian of our state has called, quote, perhaps the only true white anti-racist then in California, unquote. The leading white ally of the state's black population, starting with a remarkable speech he gave on August the 1st, 1860, which was celebrated in the black community as the anniversary of the abolition of slavery in the British West Indies on that date in the 1830s. Star King, I think, came by his anti-racism at an early age. Nearly every month when he was out here, he wrote back to New York to a boyhood friend named Randolph Ryer, who clearly must have been a mixed race since Star King joshed with him as being a black scamp, an octoroon, while reporting candidly on things like how much his wife hated living out here in what she called San Francisco, this shanty town on sand dunes as it was, or reporting the birth of his only son, whom he named Frederick Randolph Star King. The Frederick was for Frederick Henry Hedge, 
the German educated Unitarian minister who was a key figure in starting the transcendentalist movement in Boston and one who had written a benediction for Star King's mission of taking a reverence for human rights and for nature out to the frontier. I'm now co-editing the selected works of this first Western transcendentalist along with Tyler Green, a young scholar who has proven that Thomas Star King's third and least recognized accomplishment was in his four brief years of remaining life here in California to start the campaign to save the natural beauty of Yosemite Valley from ranchers and encroachment. Star King had written a book about the White Hills of New Hampshire before coming out west. And in the very first summer he was here, he went out of his way and at great expense to be one of the first, well, maybe the first 100 non-Indigenous people to ever see Yosemite Falls and Half Dome, that remarkable valley. He then persuaded pioneer landscape photographer Carlton Watkins, whom he'd met at the Fremonts, to go and see the valley for himself. And prints of Watkins' remarkable photos he then sent east to people like Ralph Waldo Emerson and to the influential lawyer, Frederick Billings, who had also been part of the Fremont Circle. Star King, who was always frail with tuberculosis, the endemic disease of that era, but he worked himself to an absolute frazzle, raising money and trying to keep California less racist and more in the union. And he died of diphtheria and exhaustion in March of 1864, just as Billings was beginning to persuade people in the US Congress in the very midst of an ongoing civil war to set aside Yosemite and the Mariposa Grove and give it to California to be kept as a park in perpetuity. In other words, the very start of the national park movement was virtually a memorial to a Unitarian minister. Fourthly, Star King had attracted to his preaching two successive governors of the state, Leland Stanford and Frederick Law, who put Frederick Law Olmsted, another Unitarian, the designer of New York's Central Park and the man who had run the US Sanitary Commission in charge of protecting Yosemite. Sadly, the one thing that none of these Unitarians could do during the Civil War was prevent what historian Benjamin Madley at UCLA has aptly called in a well-documented book of the same name, an American genocide. By the year of Star King's death, Austin Wiley, the former editor of the Humboldt Times, by then California's first superintendent of Indian affairs, was reporting to his counterpart in Washington that, quote, the destructive Indian war in Humboldt, Klamath, and Trinity counties promised to end only in the extermination of the Indians, unquote. Orders came down to stop the systemic, systematic murder of Indian peoples by US soldiers, but to no avail. Among the settlers, the colonial settler ideology that the indigenous people were to be displaced, if necessary, at the cost of their extermination, was simply too deeply ingrained. And there were relatively few white Americans who then thought in anything like terms of universal human rights. Perhaps the most influential were our spiritual forebears, the Unitarian Transcendentalists. We, I'm afraid, often underestimate them. <laughs> we think of them chiefly as writers. We meet them in high school or college literature classes. We read a little Emerson on self-reliance or about Thoreau at Walden. What we 
often don't get is that as Emerson's best biographer has put it, he had a mind on fire with a passion for the fuller flourishing of other human minds and souls, even those quite different from his own. So in the 1830s, he wrote a fiery protest against the removal of the Cherokee people from the Southeast. He found sparks of wisdom in Hindu and so Sufi scriptures. And one of the first female transcendentalists, Lydia Mariah Child, actually wrote what I would call America's first anti-racist novel. It's one that refused to be nostalgic about Native Americans in the East, the way um, say Cooper was in The Last of the Mohicans. She instead saw their dying dignity while living among them in Maine and wrote a novel called Hubamook in which the plot actually resolves itself in an interracial marriage in the 1820s, mind you. But this transcendental ethic committed to transcending differences in race, gender, social class, ethnicity, and religion has always been rather hard for many people to grasp and hard even for us Unitarian Universalists to maintain in the depth that our forebears did. That's why I hope you will read my book about how the transcendentalists sparked the American struggle for racial, gender, and social justice, because I think they provide clues deep in our history toward what I might call a, a healthy cleansing burn of the underbrush that keeps us from seeing the roots of our present crisis. Mother Earth, on whom we all depend, is of course close to burning through widespread selfishness. And our fragile democracy, as we saw on the 6th of January, has nearly exploded with another outburst of white supremacy. So what can we do now? My best counsel comes again from our transcendentalist forebears. They were far more spiritually disciplined than many of us are today. They had the practice of starting every day with reflection, with gratitude, which also, of course, was central to indigenous spirituality in relation to living well on this earth and as a good ancestor to the generations yet to come. And then since uh, we paler people tend to be white and wordy, they kept journals, as I now try to do. All the transcendentalists kept journals as a way of staying in touch with conscience, and reflecting on the events of their lives and in the public world. Secondly, they made friendships, spiritual friendships that transcended differences in all directions, as Lydia Mariah Child did to those victimized by history, but also, and this is harder, toward those whom Star King and Bret Hart addressed, those who were tempted to be supremacists or to ignore cruelty. Thirdly, they studied the past, history. One of the worst flaws of white America today is that I don't think we even know what our forebearers did or have left undone. And what is therefore ours to do in what some have called a third reconstruction. I would call it also a renewal of reconciliation with earth along with the first peoples on the lands where we now dwell. Fourthly, when I read the Transcendentalists, one of the things that strikes me is that they don't waste time on guilt. Audrey Lord, the black poet, once said, guilt is not a response to anger. It's a response to one's own actions or lack of action. If it leads to change, then it can be useful, since it is then no longer guilt but the beginning of deeper knowledge. 
And yet too often guilt is just another name for impotence and for defensiveness destructive of communication and becomes a device to protect ignorance and the continuation of things the way they are, the ultimate protection for changelessness, unquote. Another thing I noted about the transcendentalists is that remarkably they were good organizers or they couldn't have put together that huge humanitarian relief effort in the middle of civil war. They did it in partnership with many others who were not like them. This is what our Unitarian Universalist Service Committee does these days. Already they have partnerships with indigenous communities that have been threatened by climate change, flooding the islands of the Pacific, the coastlands of Alaska, the lowlands of Louisiana, driving people from the Triangle of Central America northward, helping people in Africa and the Middle East who have been driven to be migrants and refugees. They also help and learn from indigenous and migrant groups here in the United States, the supposed land of the free and home of the brave. Lastly, when I read the Transcendentalists, I see people who had no pretensions that they were going to be able to fix everything. There's one thing I've learned about white supremacy culture. It's that we think we're omnipotent and we are not. We are not that powerful. Instead, we have to learn to say to ourselves that much depends on a greater spirit than our own, a spirit that transcends us all. We need to be humble enough to pray for that great spirit to show us what is ours to do, our humble path. The one thing that we can touch today and tomorrow and in the week ahead until we meet again and encourage one another to be self-transcendent. On that note, let us pause in prayerful silence for just a moment or two before we conclude our worship together. as it is in the meditations of our hearts, when we are most at one with ourselves, our best selves, so may it be also in our words and in our deeds. Amen. Thank you so much, John. That was a really interesting history of what's what has gone before us. This congregation is a theologically diverse religious community with membership open to all who are in accordance with our principles, mission, and vision. We are a welcoming congregation to people of all sexual orientations, and we unconditionally welcome any and all of you to our community of mutual caring. Our congregation is entirely self-governed by democratic process. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide for all the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and our institutional well-being. You are now invited to participate in the blessing of giving by giving through the website that's listed in comments or mailing in your contribution. Thank you.
We have basked in the warmth and beauty of this flame and this community. As the chalice flame is extinguished, let us carry its glow within. Let us kindle new sparks within these walls and beyond. From here in peace, go in love. Go from here in peace, go in love. Go from here in peace, go in love. In love, go in Shalom, salam alaikum, blessed be Ashe Aho. Stay home, stay safe, and stay connected.